All right, next big topic. And I know this is one uh, people in the US are very excited about. Yunus Musa, how big of a deal is it that he's committed his international future to the USA over England? Nick Mendola, what's your initial thought on this? How good is Yunus Musa? And is he kind of uh, going to be a star for the US for the next decade uh, and a generational talent? Wow. Yes. That is, that is heavy. Ar- the, the question started and I was like, all right, I'm ready. And that- yeah. I'm sorry, who's the American or the, the non-American yeah. here that, that's oh, hyping up boy. American youngsters like that? No, so, it's our job. Back off. Here's, here's what I'd say. I would say he is is going to be an immense player in CONCACAF, um, even with Jamaica adding everything they are. That said, I have no idea what to make. He had two really fun games against nobody, right? I mean, with all due respect, they were – they were kind of B-ish teams, right? Like they, they weren't the full-fledged, full-force team. So that said, I'm very excited. He captained England. Is he the midfielder that we saw with the U.S.? Um, gotten a little bit of an argument online with someone yesterday because he's playing all of his time at, at right him. mid and left mid for Valencia. So is he an interior player? Is he a winger? His stats, if you look at some of the comparison stats against wingers are terrible, but Valencia is not doing great this year. So I still have to call him kind of in that, that second group. Right. And not to have been burned by Julian green, uh, who I think has been very good and overlooked or burned by Gideon Zelalem or whoever, but I will really reserve judgment until um, I see him with the U S in a big game with their best guns blazing. Andy, what about you? I mean, you're not going to sit on the fence like that, are you? (laughs) Nick is talking a whole lot of sense right now. I mean, how many times have we done this? How (laughs) many times do we have to do this before we look at an 18-year-old who has less than 1,300 minutes in league play in his entire career and say, let's just see before we decide what he's going to be? I'm looking at football reference here, the numbers, where he falls in terms of percentile of, of, of all the important metrics at the various positions he's played this season. He has one goal and one assist, but in terms of shots and assists and what they would expect his assist to be, it's virtually zeros all the way across the board per 90 minutes. He is in the first percentile, which means the very, 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 very bottom of all of those important attacking categories. Passing wise, he's kind of middling in some of those defensive actions is where he has a base to build on at this point of his career. Obviously young and energetic. He's clearly an intelligent player who knows how to apply the pressure defensively and, and, and win the ball back interceptions, recoveries, uh, pressures, tackles. These are all very good numbers for kind of an attacking player uh, in, in those positions. I just don't know though. Uh, My question is, over the course of, I guess, three quarters of a season now as a professional, have we seen him develop and improve any at all? Because he's not playing as much now as he did at the beginning of the season. Uh, You know, that's a little bit of a worrying sign. Again, he was 17 when the season started. They needed someone to play, and he got minutes and an opportunity, which, of course, is going to push him on to just another pedestal that we look uh, look at him in. But we talk about Chelsea all the time for Christian Pulisic, Valencia is as unstable a club as there is in the entire world right now. As an environment goes, I don't know that that's the best place for him to be. I just, I have questions and I would like to see a little bit more evidence on paper on the field before I say he's going to be this good or he can be, you know, he can be one, a a generational talent. Yeah. I I kind of set you guys up there, but um, I'm not, we're not taking the bait. We're not taking it. Yeah, um, you know, as an Englishman losing him to the U.S., it's fine because there's about, you know, 10 or 12 other decent attacking midfielders that England have maybe ahead of him. So I think it's a smart decision from his point of view. I really do think that because he's going to play a lot on the international stage. You you brought it up there. Where's his best position? Is it out wide? Is it centrally? We saw him in those games against Wales and Panama and kind of line up in the midfield three, but then can play out on the right. Is it the U.S. can line up in a 4-2-3-1 or a 4-3-3? I think it'd be quite flexible. Um, and Greg Bohart has said it, you know, uh, w- when it was announced, he's a player for now, but he's a player for the future as well. So there's a lot of potential there. And a shout out to Greg Bohart. I saw someone on Twitter 
say, you know, he's recruiting at SEC level in terms of getting <laughs> players in so Gino Dest and there's talk of, you know, having coaches on the ground in Valencia just to, you know, whisper into Yunus Musa's ear to get him on board. And, and you know, Balogun might be next. There's a few other talents there. Dual Nationals, Efren Alvarez, looks like he might be going to Mexico, but there's that's going to be a big part of building this U.S. men's national team in the years ahead. And obviously this is a, a big move uh, for the U.S. But Nick, the golden generation, that conversation, do we feel like we're there yet? Because when you look at the starting 11 that the U.S. could have, this is the best pool of talent they've ever had, right? At this young of an age, playing at top European teams. Yeah, and, and listen, Joe, I apologize that um, you got you only have uh, Gareth, the English Burhalter Southgate coaching your team. But, uh, and I'm kidding. I'm going to get my waistcoat out. <laughs> yeah, you got to do that. But here's what I don't know with the U.S. First of all, do I think it's a golden generation? Obviously, time will bear that out. But I think it has every single opportunity beyond that especially given where we're starting from the development in this country uh, is off the charts where MLS has come in 25, 26 years is insane and goes to kind of the, the richness in, of this country, both in, in population and in money. That said, what I don't know when we start to talk about golden generation is kind of exactly what we've been beating around the bush with, with, uh, with Musa, which is uh, when Weston McKenney was at Schalke and David Magna was putting him at, center mid and right back and center forward josh Sargent's playing center forward in a team that just asks him basically to run as hard as he can at the back line willy-nilly often as the only forward at least last year sergino dest we are now seeing him at barcelona become more of a wing back but we didn't know what to make with him so when i look at musa uh and players like that i think even to tyler adams who's playing right mid right now in this sort of weird Nagelsmann three, one, four, two. And, and there was an interview with Adams a couple of months ago where he talked about where he lines up and how Nagelsmann's system, which is why I would love to see him at Spurs or something like that is about having him players move all over the pitch. So he, you know, I start at, at right mid, but for every player on the outside, there's a period in the game that Nagelsmann expects us to come inside and run 10 minutes of the attack. So I want to see these guys in Burhalter's system, and he's now given himself the ingredients to make a great meal. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm hoping to feast. Andy, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, that's hilarious. Um, Andy, uh, they're playing Jamaica and, and Northern Ireland coming up, uh, which we'll have you covered on Pro Soccer Talk at EmbassySports.com, all the angles from that. But is this now this roster about getting the best talent in the roster and then figuring out the formation and how they're going to play? Like Nick said, is it about just getting the best players on the pitch and then trying to figure it all out? Or do you need to have specialists? Because Moose is one of these players that can play in a bunch of different roles. And he's not the only one. Like, that's kind of... 24 months from now, the narrative around the U.S. men's national team, assuming that they have been to the World Cup, will either be... That versatility was their greatest strength, and it's why they made a deep run into the tournament, or versatility and a lack of an identity and knowing players' best positions is why they went out in the group stage. I, we don't know which one it's going to be. I, I guess if I had to pick a semifinal run versus out in the group stage, I'd say probably out in the group stage because it's a young group of players, the vast majority of which who have not been to a world cup yet. And so they're still figuring out who they are as an individual, you know, individually and also collectively as well. When you consider what the last 12 months have been like uh, and with, with the pandemic and the lack of, of, of time in international camp and time spent together and playing together and training together and getting to know each other further and just building a, a team identity over that time. It's been a, a real missed opportunity, but it's full of players who can play all over the field. And Nick did a great job of, of, of running down the list there. You can even throw Christian Pulisic into that mix, given the, the positions that he's played at Chelsea this season. Uh, they have the potential at their best during the prime years 
to be similar to kind of that Leipzig team where they have a lot of players who just, who are comfortable on the ball, who are comfortable without the ball, uh, defending one-on-one, defending space. They, they have a lot of players who can do a lot of things. It's just about bringing it together now and under two years until the World Cup, it's definitely time to start working out um, not just what the lineup or the formation is going to be, but partnerships. I want to see Weston McKinney and Tyler Adams building a partnership in midfield and how those two understand the go forward and drop back when, when the other one goes, the other one stay. Just every the, the nuances and the small details are what's going to be really important. That's what we have to start working on now because we know who the stars are. We know who all the stars are. We can argue over Roster places 18 through 23, but we know who's on the field for game number one in that World Cup, again, assuming that they're there. Nick, how important is it that these players play regularly now? We talk about Yunus Musa hasn't been playing regularly at Valencia. Pulisic hasn't had much of a look in at Chelsea. Zach Steffen, I spoke to him recently, hasn't been playing regularly at Manchester City. There's a lot of players there, even Weston McKenney, for how well he's done at Juventus. He's often you know, the first man off the bench in a lot of games. Um, is that the next big step for this young U.S. men's national team pool of players to play regularly? Well, it is. Of course, you want them to play regularly. But I did do some some research into this because we've been talking about the Pulisic story at Chelsea, which is going to dominate the conversation for probably as long as he's there, right? A year from now, if he's played 30 straight games and he sits out three, it's going to be here we go again. Uh, but, you know, we talked before and there are three big players and I want to count Pulisic as above the fold, right? So with all due respect to your Aaron Johansson's and your DeAndre Edlins, who have played at very high levels, um, this is about being that elite U.S. player. So I look at Josie Altidore, who was the U.S. player of the year before in 2013, the year that he transferred to Sunderland, played almost nothing. Uh, We don't really have a great comparison because he got hurt in the first game of the World Cup. But remember, he had just scored two goals against Nigeria or a goal and an assist. I can't remember exactly. And was, look at this, we've got the forward in the prime of his career. Clint Dempsey, after winning player of the year, goes to Spurs. Um, Now, he still played 43 games that year, by the way. And 12 goals and seven assists is not a bad return. Uh, And what did he do in the World Cup? He scored against Belgium. He scored against Germany. He was great. Uh, And then Michael Bradley is the last name. And thanks to Andy for this, because I didn't even think to look it up. But the year he spent the second half of the season with Villa and played like 100 minutes, he played every minute of the Gold Cup, uh, except five, uh, scored against Mexico in that 4-2 loss that cost his father's job, essentially. So I just think it's, if it goes on for a couple of years, be worried. But when we're talking about those upper crust guys, they're going to be fine. Now, whether that works out for... I don't know. Uh, Josh Hardridge playing all the time. This is great. I can't think of an example where the guy's not playing a lot. Um, They're going to be okay. There you go. So uh, over on Pro Soccer Talk and NBCSports.com, I listed my U.S. men's national team starting lineup at the World Cup started today and who I think, you know, would be um, playing uh, on that starting lineup. Zach Steffen in goal, Sergino Dest right back, Robinson left back, Brooks, Chris Richards as centre-backs, McKenney and Tyler Adams as the holding midfielders, Pulisic, Yunus Musa, and Gio Reyna as attacking midfielders, and Josh Sargent up top. And if that is the case, and these players develop as we think they will over the next few years, that's a very exciting time for U.S. men's national team fans. And see, we've gone full circle there. Started with excitement for U.S. fans. And if you look at Twitter right now, pretty much they're going to be back-to-back World Cup champions uh, mm-hmm. when we come around to 2026. So very realistic expectations there for the USA. But on a serious note, massive, massive boost that Yunus Musa has decided to play for the US over England. Could have played for Italy, could have played for Ghana. But he's with the US men's national team. And he's a very, very exciting young midfield talent. 